Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class on the psychological aspects of drug use and abuse. This is probably going to be one of my last lectures for the semester, so if you've been following along with me all the way from the beginning, then <laughs> thanks and give yourself a pat on the back for being really patient. <laughs> and seriously, I hope you've learned some stuff and I hope it's been interesting to you. Uh, we're in the last unit of the class, obviously we're, we're talking about treatment. And so as you can see from the title of my lecture today, I'm just going to kind of continue in that direction. More specifically, I'm going to focus on cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. This is a form of psychotherapy that you've probably heard about before. It's fairly commonly practiced and for good reason. It's um, a form of psychotherapy that has uh, demonstrated scientific support for treating a variety of different disorders when it's done properly. Uh, those disorders being things like depression, some types of anxiety disorders, and again, when done properly, some types of substance use disorders. So it's, it's a form of psychotherapy that's out there. Uh, when done well, it can be very effective. It's the form of psychotherapy that I was trained in for what that's worth and that I have practiced in my own clinical work. And it's been mentioned before, actually, in my previous lectures. So I talked about uh, self-management and recovery training, SMART type uh, community support groups. These community support groups are based in large part on principles that come out of cognitive behavioral therapy and actually a related form of psychotherapy called rational emotive behavioral therapy, which in some ways preceded CBT, but is pretty similar. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy, identifying some core features of it, hopefully kind of making it seem relatively straightforward to you. I'm going to do a quick review of the biopsychosocial model, which I've talked about before, and I'll just give a couple examples of treatments for different substance use disorders, different drug problems, and hopefully uh, give you a sense of how we can, at least in some cases, put together bio, psycho, and social uh, interventions uh, to treat uh, addiction. Okay, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy begins with a couple uh, interesting and I think rather important ideas. And, and one of these is simply that thoughts influence behavior. Um, this may not seem like a, a great revelation, uh, but, it, uh, but it's important and hopefully it makes sense. The idea being that uh, how you act in the world, what you do, how you respond to especially difficult situations in your life, isn't entirely controlled by how you think about it, uh, those situations, but your thoughts influence those situations. So if you encounter encounter a, uh, a loss or a setback in your life and you have very, very negative thoughts about that, that will tend to make your feelings of depression and worry and whatnot much, much worse than they would otherwise be. If you have somewhat more flexible and adaptive thoughts, then you might still feel somewhat bad, but you would feel not as bad and perhaps be better able to cope. That's the basic idea. And if we apply that idea to the world of drug and alcohol, you know, substance use problems, um, we can see hopefully some points of connection. So how, uh, you know, when we think about drugs, we're thinking about how people respond to cues in their environment associated with drugs, how they uh, respond to situations in which they have opportunities to use drugs, and particularly how they respond in situations where they use drugs again after a period of time when they've successfully abstained from use or controlled their use. So there are all these situations out there in which people, you know, people who have drug use problems, have opportunities to think, and how they're thinking in those situations may make it more likely that they'll use drugs or hopefully, how they're thinking can make it less likely. And that's really, again, a, a key feature, an important aspect, if you will, of cognitive behavioral therapy. And as I've mentioned in classes before, cognitive behavioral therapy isn't just one thing. It's actually a set of different skills that you would train someone in to help them deal with these different thought, or to help the people deal with different situations in which there are cues associated with drug use or opportunities to use drugs and um, train those folks to recognize better the thoughts that they're having in those situations and if possible, control better the thoughts that they're having in those situations. So just to give an example of this, you could imagine that you know, there's a situation that many people might find themselves in, that they play video games from time to time. Um, video game use may be associated with thoughts about drug use. You know, if you're someone who gets high uh, or drinks alcohol when you play video games, of course many people do that. And over time, 
those video games, you know, the controller, the game, you know, reading a blog about the game when you're, uh, you know, online, etc., can all become cues associated with drug use. So when the user is walking around in his life or her life and he encounters one of those cues, sometimes without even realizing it, he'll start to think about drugs and have feelings urges about drugs and maybe even engage in behaviors that have to do with drugs like going to purchase drugs or, or trying to excuse himself to find some time and place to use drugs and so on and so on. So to use my previous example, let's imagine that for you playing video games is associated with drug use, with using marijuana particularly. And let's imagine that it is associated in such a way that it serves as a cue for your drug use. Meaning that you know, when you play video games, when you're around video games, you often have an emotion or feeling of craving that is connected to a behavior, the likely use of the drug. You're likely to smoke pot. Not always, but just often. As I said before, part of what you might do in cognitive behavioral therapy, especially kind of early on in the process, is recognize what those cues are. And maybe you hadn't really noticed it before, you hadn't really thought too deeply about it, and so it is kind of a surprise to you, like, oh yeah, I can kind of see how something about video games triggers this feeling for me. Oh, I guess it's probably because in the past I used to smoke pot and play video games a lot with my roommates, and maybe that's kind of how I learned that connection or that association. Part of what you might do is just recognize or learn to recognize those cues. Um, you know, maybe you already recognize those cues, you already kind of understand that those things go together. Another thing that you would then do in cognitive behavioral therapy is try to notice the thoughts that come up when those cues are present. So for instance, you might have in the presence of a cue thoughts like, I really need to smoke, that is, I really need to smoke some marijuana, or I can smoke just a little bit of pot, That's that, or maybe you know, smoking pot makes me enjoy the game more, smoking pot helps me relax better. Those are all thoughts that you're having in your head, and again, the idea is those thoughts are there, you might be kind of aware of them, but you're probably not paying a ton of attention to them because you're doing other things with your brain, with your mind. What you'd be doing in cognitive behavioral therapy, once you've kind of recognized cues that are related to drug use, is try to also practice recognizing the thoughts that come up in response to those cues. Thoughts like the ones I have on the screen here, or whatever would be relevant to you. Uh, a lot of the work of a good cognitive behavioral therapist is practicing and listening with the client so that the two of them together can identify what those thoughts are that are particular to that client. You know, it's not about the therapist telling the person, oh, you must be having a thought about this. It's about the therapist encouraging and listening and working with the client so that he or she can identify those thoughts that seem real to him or seem real to her. So what do we do once we've identified these cognitions? Well, a lot of the work of cognitive behavioral therapy, as you know, as the process continues, is looking at the nature of these thoughts, kind of breaking them apart and analyzing them, almost like a scientist would. And a key insight in cognitive behavioral therapy is that most of these thoughts that we're having, these automatic cognitions, are distorted in the sense that they're inaccurate. Um, meaning they're not really truthful. So a, a thought might be something like, I need to smoke pot in order to enjoy this video game. Now, that's not massively distorted or massively inaccurate, but it's at least somewhat inaccurate. Is it literally true that you have to smoke pot to enjoy a video game? Well, of course not. Um, sometimes we talk to ourselves or we have thoughts in our head which are distorted or inaccurate in a way of being more um, of being uh, over exaggerated or, or more precise or, or um, you know, sort of complete than they really need to be. Um, so anyway, one thing we do in, in cognitive behavioral therapy is try to identify the nature of those distortions. And depending on the type of cognitive behavioral therapy you practice, there are all sorts of different subtle distinctions between types of inaccuracy or distortion in thoughts. Um, Another insight that you might have in cognitive behavioral therapy is that many thoughts, even if they're not entirely distorted, may be merely just unhelpful, unhelpful to you with respect to the goals you have for your treatment. So you might have a thought like, I can smoke just a bit of pot when I'm playing video games. Now that may not be entirely a distortion or entirely inaccurate, like yeah, perhaps you could literally smoke a small amount of marijuana, maybe 
that that could be literally done by you but that, that may be kind of an unhelpful thought to have if your goal is to cut down or stop smoking marijuana um, so this may seem all very very obvious um, but the way this works in therapy or the way this plays out is you spend a lot of time with your client uh, trying to get him or get her to recognize the thoughts that he is having or that she is having in situations that involve drugs often in response to particular cues and then talk it over with them you, you spend time talking with them about the nature of those thoughts and hopefully get them to recognize various types of distortions or inaccuracies or various types of unhelpfulness in those thoughts you know it's something that should evolve kind of organically in the session and once you've uh, you know, started to identify these thoughts, you can expose or challenge the distortions and hopefully get the person to come up with other replacement thoughts. So the thought might be something like, you know, I need to smoke pot in order to feel relaxed. Um, a replacement thought, not particular to this situation with video games, I suppose, is that might be something like, there are other ways that I can relax or calling up a friend helps me to relax when I'm you know, trying to relax but I don't want to smoke pot. These are all thoughts that might, uh, you know, might be uh, possible or plausible alternative thoughts. And it's not that you just easily can find them and then replace them, like replacing you know, a spark plug in your engine. It's more like you practice with the client or the client practices with you, the therapist, the different uh, alternatives that he or she could use. And over time, those alternatives are easier and easier to use as substitutes for the automatic thoughts which are connected to drug use. So let's try and put this all together to see how it might work. Um, again, let's imagine for you uh, playing video games is a cue for drug use. It's not the only time you use drugs, but maybe it's a, it's a significant part of your life playing video games and it's a significant time when you often smoke marijuana and let's say you're trying to quit smoking marijuana. That's your treatment goal that you've come up with. So one thing we could do is try to get away from those cues. You, know, you could, for instance, just try to cultivate other habits. You might, you know, take up exercising or meditation or yoga or volunteer at a dog walk or something like that as an alternative just to get you away from video games, like sell your PlayStation, whatever. That may make sense for you. And, and for some people, that's going to seem like a good approach. For others, maybe not. So again, you might go do another activity when you encounter video games or when you start to feel that urge to smoke pot and you're exposed to video games. If you did that, you'd probably have less craving for the drug and you'd be less likely to use the drug. You know, again, it's not an absolute guarantee. It's conceivable you would still use marijuana in other circumstances, but the basic idea or a basic idea from cognitive behavioral therapy is managing cues or avoiding them if possible. So, uh, you know, again, another part of it or another component of cognitive behavioral therapy is recognizing those thoughts. So thoughts like an automatic cognition of, I need to smoke pot. You know, you're exposed to video games and you have the thought almost immediately like, gosh, it'd be great to smoke pot and play video games right now. Uh, or you might have a thought like, I could smoke just a little bit of pot. That wouldn't be that big a deal. What if you could challenge those thoughts and maybe replace them with things like, I don't need to smoke pot. That's not an absolute need that I have in my life. It's something that in the past I've done. Maybe I enjoyed it. Maybe I didn't. But I don't need to do it the way I need to breathe air or drink water in order to survive. And that thought, I need to smoke, is in some sense thus a distortion. Or the thought, you might have a replacement thought, like, it's hard for me to smoke just a little. Like, you know, yeah, it's technically possible. It's not an entirely inaccurate distortion. But for me personally, in my life, it's very difficult for me to get a little bit high. I often end up getting rather high and certainly more high than I want to, given that I'm trying to quit smoking pot. So that's maybe an unhelpful thought. And over the course of cognitive behavioral therapy, you identify those automatic cognitions and you challenge them and rehearse in your mind or rehearse by writing out on a piece of paper different alternative thoughts. And you try to basically catch yourself in the moment having those automatic thoughts and you make with effort the substitutions. If you're able to do that, you probably have less craving, you're probably less likely to use uh, you know, marijuana or use whatever the drug it is that you're talking about.
Changing thoughts in this way makes it easier to change emotions and to change behavior. The idea or a big idea of cognitive behavioral therapy is that we work on the thoughts because they're relatively speaking easier to manipulate or change than our emotions. Like it's kind of hard to change how you feel. Sometimes you talk to people you know, who are really depressed and they say, oh yeah, I just want to not feel depressed anymore. Or you talk to people who are trying to quit drinking alcohol and they say, oh, I just, I just want to give it up. I want to stop drinking. I want to not want to drink alcohol. It's hard to change how you feel. I mean, we, I think we probably all recognize that on some basic level. Uh, but we sometimes can change how we think. And by changing how we think, we have kind of a, a tool or a mechanism for shifting our emotions and ultimately shifting our behaviors. Uh, but to be clear, this is not something that you do once in like, click, you're fixed. It's more like it's a set of skills that you practice over a course of weeks and months. And over time, it gets easier for you to do what you want to do in your life, which may be feeling less depressed or being more active or uh, being more socially connected or in the case of drugs and alcohol, managing your drug use, decreasing your alcohol use, stopping your cocaine use, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, it's a set of skills. You have to work with a trained therapist and you have to really try. It's, it's not easy but it can be effective for some folks. I kind of already answered this question, you know, does cognitive behavioral therapy work? Well, it's a widely used treatment for addictions and it's widely used because it's, um, it's something that you can train people to do. It takes weeks and months, but it doesn't take years and years, at least not for most folks. Um, and there's a lot of research on it, uh, research comparing cognitive behavioral therapy to other forms of psychotherapy or comparing cognitive behavioral therapy to no therapy, like which, who gets better faster, who controls their drug use better, people who get CBT or people who get no therapy. Almost always in the research, it's the people who get the cognitive behavioral therapy. There's research, like I said already, that compares cognitive behavioral therapy to other forms of psychotherapy. And here, the results are a little bit more mixed. In some research, cognitive behavioral therapy looks superior to other forms of therapy. In other research that I've read, it's not as clear that CBT is the best, but most people, I think most researchers, most clinicians, people are familiar with this area of study. Uh, myself, you know, for instance, most of us would agree that cognitive behavioral therapy is a good choice. If you're going to pick a psychotherapy, it's a good choice. And um, for what it's worth, if you yourself are, uh, you know, suffering from mental health problems, including uh, drug or alcohol problems, or if you know someone who is, of course, most of us probably at some point in our life either have a mental health problem or know someone who does, I would strongly recommend that you seek treatment from a competent professional who's trained in doing cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not the only form of, co of therapy out there, but it's one of the better ones for most types of problems. Okay, with all that covered, having talked about cognitive behavioral therapy for quite a bit now, hopefully you got a basic sense of how it works, let's move on and quickly review the biopsychosocial model. And I talked about this last time, but it's worth quickly reviewing. Biopsychosocial model, it, it's a phrase, it's a term you've probably heard in other science classes, maybe especially if you've taken like an abnormal psychology class, and it's just meant to serve as a reminder to us that there are different factors or variables that can contribute to a, uh, a behavior. Um, in this case, drug or alcohol use. And those could be biological factors like genetic risk for substance use. Uh, it could be disruptions in the functioning of the neurobiological systems of the brain. It can be um, things like that. Uh, there are also psychological factors or variables that contri can contribute to use. Uh, patterns of learning through classical and operant conditioning, cues, um, expectations or thoughts that people have related to drug use, all sorts of psychological variables. And finally, there are social variables, especially things like uh, the behaviors of your peer group, your norms for what you should be doing with regards to drug and alcohol use. You know, are you are your friends people who all smoke cigarettes? Are your friends people who all abstain from alcohol use? Are your friends all people who, you know, smoke marijuana? Those, uh, you know, the answers to those questions will probably have some bearing on your own use of those drugs. And it's not that any one of these uh, broad groups of factors or variables is the most important, it's just that in principle all of them make some sort of contribution. And for the purposes of treatment, it's ideal if we have some sort of interventions for at least some of the variables under each of these broad headings. You know, can we do something to address the biological side of things? Can we do something to address the psychological side of things, the social side of things, and so on?
So with that in mind, let's consider a few treatment examples. So first up, nicotine, most commonly in cigarette smoke, um, but also in other forms like smokeless tobacco or more recently in electronic cigarettes or vaping. Uh, what can we do to treat people who are dependent on nicotine? Well, there are some different options. I'm going to kind of highlight a few of them here. One is just various forms of counseling or psychotherapy. You can imagine having a trained counselor uh, helping you if you're someone who's trying to quit smoking, uh, work through your ambivalence about smoking, or maybe do a little bit of motivational interviewing to kind of overcome that ambivalence, get committed and motivated to change, and then also maybe set up a concrete plan for how are you going to change? Are you going to quit on a particular date? Are you going to use any sorts of medications, any other forms of psychotherapy? How are you going to best organize yourself and get ready to um, get ready to quit using the drug? Um, certainly having someone uh, you know there to help you work through that can be really helpful. Having someone there for when you relapse. You know, it's very likely that if you're trying to quit smoking, you'll start smoking again for at least a brief period of time. That's a relapse. And how you handle that relapse will be important. You know, if you totally give up and get t entirely discouraged, then you may end up smoking for a long time in your life. If you're able to deal flexibly and kind of cope with that relapse and not get too discouraged, you can probably ultimately be successful in quitting your nicotine use. So having a you know, trained psychotherapist there who can provide maybe a little bit of motivational interviewing, maybe a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy so you can recognize cues that trigger your urges and maybe prime you for a relapse, that can be really valuable. Those would be addressing some of the psychological variables that could be uh, very important for maintaining your use or ultimately changing your use. Part of your treatment for nicotine dependence might also be nicotine replacement. So there are all sorts of options here, and probably some of these you're familiar with. There are transdermal nicotine patches, which release nicotine through your skin into your circulatory system. There's gum, which you can chew or just leave in your mouth, and that will allow absorption of nicotine or uh, nicotine inhalers. The manufacturers of some electronic cigarettes try and sell their products as kind of nicotine replacement alternatives. The idea of any any of these is to introduce nicotine into your body with less of the risks associated with cigarette smoke or smokeless tobacco, less of the tar, or maybe in the case of a, a patch or gum, no tar, you're just getting the nicotine. Nicotine by itself is not tremendously dangerous to your body as long as you don't have a compromised circulatory system. So getting a steady dose of nicotine from gum or a patch isn't really going to hurt you, and it can help you manage withdrawal symptoms. So without those replacement sources, if you just quit using uh, cigarettes or you quit using smokeless tobacco, you'll almost immediately go into withdrawal for nicotine, and you'll feel pretty uncomfortable uh, for a period of days and weeks. Um, and that, that discomfort can provide really powerful negative reinforcement for using uh, nicotine again, for getting back into smoking because you feel so crummy when you don't smoke. By introducing nicotine replacement for a period of time, you can help deal with that. You manage the withdrawal symptoms, and you know there's a fair bit of research at this point on nicotine replacement therapies. Generally speaking, nicotine replacement therapy increases the success rate of quitting. So if we define a success as someone who's able to maintain abstinence from smoking, like they quit smoking for six months or maybe a year or longer, folks who have nicotine replacement tend to do a little bit better. Um, some people, um, for what's worth myself, quit without using uh, cigarettes, without using nicotine replacement. It can be done, uh, but gum can be helpful. Um, it's funny, I think about this years and years ago, I knew a psychiatrist, I used to work with him, uh, who had been a smoker for many, many years in his life and was pretty much just a very long-term nicotine gum user. You know, at the time I got to know him, he hadn't been uh, smoking cigarettes, he said, for you know, probably more than 10 years, but he continued to use nicotine gum because the gum by itself was not particularly dangerous to him. Getting that low dose of nicotine every few hours um, didn't bother his body. It was helpful. And he knew that if he stopped using that, he'd start to go into withdrawal and he'd feel pretty crummy. And he had the sense that that would make him likely to get back into smoking, something he didn't want to do point here is that nicotine replacement, it's obviously a medical intervention. It's a, it's a drug, although it's one you can get over the counter now, which is great. Uh, but that's one way that you can address sort of the biological side of your, of your drug use. You know, the fact that you'll go into withdrawal and withdrawal can be unpleasant and 
I guess you could say negative reinforcement for those unpleasant physical symptoms is, gets us back into sort of the psychology of drug use, but clearly nicotine replacement can be part of the solution for some folks. There are also some medications for nicotine uh, dependence. There's Zyban or Bupri <laughs> Bupropion. Uh, I always screw up those medical names. This is actually just the antidepressant drug Wellbutrin, uh, branded under a different name. Uh, it's just been observed clinically that antidepressants can sometimes help people get over um, uh, get over nicotine dependence. Uh, the mechanism here isn't entirely clear, at least it's not clear to me uh, the last time I checked the pharmacology literature, but what probably happens is that taking an antidepressant like Zyban helps you, you stabilize your mood and that makes you feel less unhappy or cranky or irritable during that period of time when you're withdrawing from nicotine. So all those negative emotions, which a bit like the negative physical sensations of withdrawal, might lead you to get back into smoking. Like, oh, I feel so irritable, I feel so stressed out, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go back and smoke. Um, managing those negative feelings via Zyban probably makes it easier for you to sustain yourself through that withdrawal period until the withdrawal symptoms kind of subside and then you're better able to keep on going with your um, with your uh, non uh, your your abstinence from from cigarettes another thought is that many people use nicotine as a way of coping with stress and taking a dose of antidepressants probably helps you cope with stress so you kind of in a sense are substituting this different drug for nicotine Another drug which is cop commonly used is Vera. <laughs> Man, why am I so bad at this today? Um, Ran Veranicillin. Oh wow, that's terrible. That's going to make me really unhappy, and I'm, I'm going to look up the pronunciation after this lecture. Or more commonly, Chantix. There's a good name. That's an easy one to pronounce. Uh, Chantix is a nicotine receptor partial agonist. So what it, that means by partial agonist is it partly activate some of the same receptors that respond to nicotine in your cigarettes or in your smokeless tobacco. So it gives you some of the feeling of using nicotine, but not so much so as to give you the full effect of, of nicotine. And so it helps you kind of feel less craving for nicotine because your body isn't in going into withdrawal and kind of looking for that nicotine if you're regularly taking your Chantix. Um, but because Chantix itself doesn't activate those same receptors as much as nicotine does, it's not the case that you end up getting addicted to Chantix as like a clear substitute for nicotine. So again, what are we doing here is we're addressing kind of at a biological level, a pharmacological level, some of the mechanisms of nicotine dependence, which can influence some of the psychology of the drug use. You know, things like mood and craving, these are psychological variables, but they can be managed somewhat by using the appropriate medications. So thinking a little bit about therapy, thinking a little bit about medical or biological options. We also think when it comes to nicotine that relapse is common. I mean, this is true for almost all drug use disorders, uh, any sort of addiction really. Uh, but in the case of nicotine, there's just ample evidence that most people who try and quit have to quit several times in a row before they're successful, meaning they're able to sustain their quit. And uh, again, it can be on the average of like kind of six or eight times. Uh, for what this is worth in my own experience, I've repeatedly tried to quit smoking before I was ultimately successful. And uh, what can help is having social support, you know, encouragement from people who are also trying to quit, uh, having friends who are not cigarette users, having a partner who's not a cigarette user or a tobacco user can make it much easier for you to quit. Uh, so when we think about kind of the social part of the biopsychosocial model, part of what can be helpful with people who are trying to quit using nicotine is to um, cultivate different social contacts. And so that could be joining a support group for people who are trying to quit smoking, calling up a you know support hotline if you suddenly feel like you really need to talk to someone about how much you're craving uh, nicotine. Uh, finding friends who don't smoke or finding friends who engage in activities where you just don't smoke when you do those activities like playing sports you know, you're not going to be smoking while you're playing basketball or while you're playing hockey or, or so on um, all of those things can address the social dimension or the social part of the biopsychosocial model
Let's move on to another example, alcohol. Um, here, you know, it's kind of the same story. We can begin by noting that counseling, psychotherapy of various sorts, can be helpful in getting people to plan for cutting down or quitting their alcohol use and to manage their relapse. And here, motivational interviewing is much used to help people resolve their ambivalence, feel motivated and uh, committed to making a change, whether that's cutting down their alcohol use or entirely quitting their alcohol use. Also, motivational interviewing can be very effective at helping people manage their relapses because, of course, often people who are trying to cut down or control their use or even quit their use of alcohol will have periods of relapse and how they deal with those relapses can be really important. So motivational interviewing is a good uh, you know, form of psychotherapy here. Cognitive behavioral therapy, different versions of cognitive behavioral therapy have been developed that are specific to alcohol use. Those would be good options here as well to address some of the psychological dimensions of alcohol use. We turn to medications. There are a couple different options. One is the old standby disulfiram. See, I got that name right. Or more commonly, antibuse. Antibuse, as you may recall, uh, blocks acetaldehyde metabolism. It makes you really, really sick if you drink alcohol when you've been taking antibuse. So the idea is if you want to quit drinking and if you're really committed because you've worked with your therapist and you've resolved to stay committed to quitting your alcohol use, then you take your uh, you take your antibuse every day. It doesn't do anything to you. It doesn't particularly hurt you or make you feel sick until you drink alcohol, and then you get really, really sick. And so you don't drink very much alcohol, and you're aware that you'll get sick, and so it really discourages you from drinking alcohol. Um, this can be a really effective tool for some folks, of course. You know, you can always cheat by just skipping your antibuse the day that you plan to go drinking. Uh, that won't help you at all, or, or rather, then the drug won't help you at all. You, you'll be able to drink without getting massively sick from it. So it's kind of a medication that works well for some clients who are very committed, maybe especially clients who are working with a psychotherapist or a counselor to kind of stay motivated, stay committed, stay taking their antibuse. Other drugs uh, are another drug that can be helpful is naltrexone. I've mentioned that before. It's uh, marketed under the brand name Revier or Depaid. Um, naltrexone, as you may remember, is an opioid antagonist. So it was originally developed to actually treat opiate dependence, you know, people who are addicted to heroin or Oxycontin or whatever else, because it blocks opioid receptors and makes those drugs uh, less effective. So if you're overdosing on heroin, you might be given naltrexone to keep you alive. Or if you're not overdosing, but you're just trying to quit using heroin, you might be taking a daily dose of naltrexone because it blocks the receptors which would otherwise be activated by the heroin and you feel less of a sense of craving for that drug. It's just been observed uh, at first clinically that people who take naltrexone um, not only uh, feel less craving for their opiates, if there's some people who are addicted to opiates, but they also feel less craving for alcohol. Um, if you think back, if you're enrolled in my class that is, if you think back, one of the videos I showed was about a treatment program in uh, Maine, in the state of Maine, for people, young people who are addicted to opiates and in that treatment program people are given various combination drugs that include naltrexone and in one of the videos I showed uh, one of the guys remarks that ever since taking this drug he has felt less craving for opiates he's also felt less craving for alcohol and I think that's kind of an interesting and telling comment. Now why this works is it probably is the case that part of addiction to alcohol part of dependence on alcohol is it involves these same opiate receptors within your brain and so blocking them can be a helpful for some people for managing their craving for alcohol. There are other drugs, uh, including acamprosate, or marketed under Camprol. Uh, Camprol um, increases some of the inhibitory effects of GABA. Um, GABA is normally a, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Camprol kind of um, you know, sort of uh, modulates up some of the GABA systems in your brain, and this can stabilize um, mood changes during alcohol withdrawal, making withdrawal safer and less unpleasant. So if you're in acute detox for uh, alcohol use, you might be given Camprol, you might be also given some various anti-seizure medications, or you can even take Camprol under prescription um, if you're just basically not in detox, but you're withdrawing from alcohol on your own. It uh, makes people uh, more comfortable during that withdrawal process. So there's less negative reinforcement from going back to drinking. Um, if you've ever um, watched videos of people who are trying to get over alcohol use, if they're serious heavy drinkers, 
they feel really uncomfortable and they know that drinking alcohol will make those feelings go away so it's very um, powerful negative reinforcement for the behavior camprel is just one drug that helps you manage that as well so he talks a little bit about some of the psychological forms of treatment some of the pharmacological and medical forms of treatment for alcohol problems of course there's very long history uh, beginning really with AA but continuing through more um, contemporary versions of community support like SMART programs and the like. Uh, there's a long tradition of helping people to manage their drug and alcohol problems, their alcohol problems particularly here with community supports. So you might join an AA group or a SMART group um, because you get to learn some skills or maybe you go through a 12-step process that's thought to be helpful but also just so you have a group of people to hang out with who don't use alcohol or use alcohol in a very controlled way meaning that like every day or so you check in and go to an AA meeting and every day you get reminded like hey here's a few dozen other people in this room and they're all trying to quit drinking and they're all being pretty successful I can do it too you uh, work with maybe a sponsor or a mentor so you if you feel a sudden craving or really you're in a really tough position you think you're going to relapse you can call that person up and he or she will talk you through it um, this can be very very helpful for some people it sort of addresses the the social part of the biopsychosocial model for alcohol let me do one more example or maybe I think I've only got one more example in this lecture uh, let's take a quick look at my notes <laughs> Two more examples. Uh, so the next example here is stimulants, uh, drugs like cocaine or amphetamine or methamphetamine. Um, again, this is going to sound kind of um, kind of repetitious, but we can begin by looking at counseling and psychotherapy. Again, you could imagine a counselor or psychotherapist using motivational interviewing for help to help the client plan how he or she is going to quit or cut down using. Uh, having someone there to help them manage relapse would be very, very helpful. There are forms of cognitive behavioral therapy that have been developed specifically to address stimulant use. They're, they're similar, really, to other forms of cognitive behavioral therapy, but they focus on things like the stuff I've talked about, like trying to get people to recognize cues associated with their craving and their use of the drugs, um, helping people to recognize the thoughts that they have that can lead them to use those drugs and so on. And again, if you're enrolled in my class, uh, you've seen videos that I've, showed from the, uh, that I've shown from the HBO Addiction series uh, that highlight the use of cognitive behavioral therapy for stimulant addiction. And uh, it can be very helpful for some folks. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of pharmacological or medication-based uh, approaches to treating stimulant use. So unlike some of the other drugs I've talked about already, there's not a pill that your doctor can give you that's going to really help a lot for you to deal with your cocaine addiction or your amphetamine addiction. Uh, at least not at present. And the last time I checked was earlier in the summer of 2016 and I really should check again, but uh, nothing uh, presently has FDA approval as a medication to treat uh, stimulant addiction. Um, Interestingly, I did mention this before, but I'll mention it again. Our old friend Antibuse seems to be helpful uh, for uh, treating, for some people at least, for treating stimulant addiction, kind of like it's helpful for alcohol addiction, in so much as if you take Antibuse and then you use um, cocaine, let's say, or use amphetamine, you'll feel really, really high in a very uncomfortable way because uh, Antibuse interferes with dopamine metabolism. And so these drugs, uh, well, I should by that I mean cocaine, amphetamine, and so on, increase dopamine activity. If the antibuse is also blocking metabolism of dopamine, you get a lot of dopamine, which um, you might imagine would make you feel just like really, really high, and, and it does, but in, a, in an unpleasant way, like you feel too high, you get really anxious, restless, and upset. And this is, of course, unpleasant, and knowing this will hopefully discourage you from using cocaine if you're taking your antibuse. Uh, as with alcohol, you could, of course, cheat. You could just skip your antibuse on the day that you plan to use cocaine or the day that you plan to use amphetamine. Um, uh, so it kind of is a drug that works well for some people who are very committed, maybe especially people who are working with their psychologist uh, or their therapist, their counselor, to kind of overcome their addiction. And so they're really, really committed, and they're, part of their commitment is every day they take that dose of antibuse, and they remind themselves that, hey, if I slip up today, I'm going to feel really miserable. So all the more reason for me to stay abstinent from cocaine, stay abstinent from uh, from 
using amphetamines and so on. So again, outside of antabuse, uh, there's not a lot at present that can be used to treat um, addictions to, uh, to stimulants like cocaine and amphetamine, but with luck there will be some in the future. Uh, again, we're, you know, pharmacological science progresses ever onwards and hopefully there'll be some in the future, but at present not so much. As we saw with other drugs, community support can be really helpful. I mean, this is obviously a bit of a repetition from previous drug examples, um, providing encouragement, uh, providing non-using peers, you know, people to hang out with and associate yourself with who aren't using the drug can be really, really helpful for people with all sorts of drug problems because if you have a heavy drug problem, it's likely that you've alienated a lot of your non-drug using friends. You know, your family members don't hang out with you anymore. Uh, your friends who don't do drugs don't like to hang out with you anymore. The only people you hang out with are the people who use drugs. That's a problem because now you don't have a lot of social support for non-drug using, which is why joining a support group, uh, joining a treatment group, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has a parallel group called Narcotics Anonymous NA, which is similar. It's a 12 step program designed for drug use, meaning not alcohol use. There are other forms of recovery programs and support programs that are helpful again for people who have uh, stimulant use problems. Okay, so the last example here I want to talk about is opiates, and this will be pretty quick, I think, just because it's a bit of a repetition, and also because I've talked about some of the stuff in previous lectures. So right off the bat, of course, there's counseling and psychotherapy. I, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training, and so I clearly think that psycholo uh, clinical psychology and counseling can be helpful for a lot of stuff that people need help with. Um, I think in the case of opiate addiction, it's important. Uh, I myself on my internship did some clinical work with people who were hardcore heroin addicts and a lot of what we did in our psychotherapy was basic motivational interviewing, helping people to stay committed to their plan for maintaining abstinence from heroin, maintaining abstinence from various uh, opiate pills and so on. And we used a little bit of CBT for helping people to recognize cues and automatic thoughts which would feed into their, their drug use. As mentioned in previous lectures, there are some medications which seem to be pretty helpful for treatment of drug and alcohol, I'm, I'm sorry, specifically opiate problems. Naloxone uh, binds to opiate receptors, blocks them, and is uh, provides some effective reduction in craving. So that can be done to help kind of treat acute overdoses, but also to manage craving. Some people who are trying to withdraw um, or trying to quit using opiates uh, can be managed on methadone, which as you remember from previous lectures is a synthetic opiate. If you take it regularly, um, you don't get particularly high from it, but you don't go into withdrawal. So you don't have that negative reinforcement for uh, using opiates. You don't feel sick or you know, dope sick from withdrawing and you're less likely to go back to using. Um, methadone can be really helpful for some folks it requires commitment. You have to take it every day. You have to go to a clinic or hospital and have it administered by a nurse or doctor because you could overdose yourself on it otherwise. Um, more recently, buprenorphine has been developed, which works like methadone, but it can be administered by a physician and can be uh, purchased at a, a pharmacy. So you can have a bottle of pills at home. And if you just take it every day, you can manage your withdrawal that way, uh, which for some folks is going to be easier if there's not a methadone clinic near where they live, or if they are afraid of kind of the shame and the stigma associated with going to a methadone clinic. I know I've mentioned uh, before um, in class, uh, Suboxone is just a drug that, as you can see here, is a combination drug of buprenorphine and naloxone that's basically designed to hit uh, you know, sort of two angles, you know, using the naloxone to manage craving, using the buprenorphine to manage withdrawal symptoms. If you're taking Suboxone, um, there seems to be evidence that that's going to be helpful for you for managing uh, withdrawing from opiates and becoming a non-opiate user. So in the case of opiates, there are some good medications which can be helpful for some people. Again, we, it's the pharmacological or the medical part of things, the biological and biopsychosocial. And again, just like we've talked about with the other drugs, community support can be really, really helpful. Providing a group of non-using peers, providing regular encouragement, 
uh, to maintain commitment to change, maintain progress towards recovery, and to manage frustration when uh, when relapses occur. This can be really, really helpful for opiates, uh, as it was for some of the other drugs I've talked about. So I've highlighted a few examples here. I, I hope it seems pretty straightforward. What I've tried to do in each of them is, is hit some elements of bio, psycho, and social treatments. Ideally, it's good to do all three. In some cases, that's not always possible. Um, but hopefully you get a sense of how this could go together into kind of integrated care. With that in mind, we're just about done for this lecture. As always, thanks for your attention. I hope you took some notes. I hope you paid attention. I hope you have a little bit of time just to take a break now, maybe have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and let all of this sink in. I'll be back soon with some other lectures to kind of summarize some of the material that we've covered in this class. But again, for now, we can take a break. Bye-bye.